Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who have already drunk too much, um, we have nothing to do with unconventional resources, and we're not uh, mainly focused in Australia, although we have some assets in Australia. So, um, uh, pin back your logos, as I say. Uh, the theme of my presentation tonight is uh, good to great. And uh, it's very difficult. There's about a thousand uh, small to mid-cap uh, resources companies on the Australian Stock Exchange. And uh, how do you differentiate yourself from so many good companies? We've heard of uh, some, from some good companies uh, earlier. And um, so Q's uh, objective is to move from being a very good company to being a great company. The usual disclaimer. So the theme of the presentation came from a very good book that I read by a chap by the name of Jim Collins. Uh, a quote from this book, it's called Good to Great, and it tells you, gives you some information about how you make, might, might make that transition. It's entitled, Why Some Companies Make It, Make the Leap, and Others Don't. And a quote from it, managing your problems can only make you good, whereas building your opportunities is the only way to become great. And uh, that's very meaningful in the oil and gas industry, because a lot of people see the glass is being half empty. And I think if you're going to be in this business, you've got to see the uh, glass is being half full. And I certainly support some of the words that were um, by the previous speaker, Barry, um, in terms of we're very bullish about uh, the future of the oil and gas, in gas industry. So we're a very good company at the moment. Um, I joined in February uh, from uh, a, the private company background. I started a private company called Upstream Petroleum, which was sold to a company called AGR in 2006. And after my earn out, I joined uh, Q as CEO. We've got Andrew Knox here. So Andrew, if you'd like to make yourself known, he's over our CFO. So uh, after this presentation, if has, anybody has interest in uh, investing in our company, you can talk to either of us. We've got Terry White, a very accomplished um, Exploration Manager, again XBHP, uh, with uh, nearly 30 years of experience. And uh, Alex Parks recently joined us. Some of you may know Alex from, um, from his time with uh, Otto Energy. He was formerly the CEO of Otto. And uh, also, more recently, he was the CEO of Mosaic when they got taken over by AGL. On the board, we have a very accomplished board. Uh, Richard Tweedy was the managing director of our major shareholder, Todd, uh, the Todd Corporation for uh, a, a major part of his career, and he's our non-executive chairman. He's now uh, retired from uh, his work with Todd Energy. We've got Leon Musker, who's a, an accomplished lawyer from Perth, and Steve Karokne. Many of you may know Steve, uh, as you're in, uh, invested in some of his companies, uh, like Bridge Oil and uh, Ands on Australia. Uh, we've got a market capitalization of about 150, 160 million dollars, depending on the day. And uh, we've got uh, some cash in the bank. We've got about, uh, uh, there's actually an error on this slide. It's actually should be the 30th of September, but about 68 million Australian dollars as of the 30th of September, which is in our quarter report. So we're well positioned. We've got about $40 million per annum in uh, net cash flow. So we're well positioned to uh, make the next leap from good to great. We've got a very small debt facility, which is a legacy from, uh, from Mari of only $4 million. We've also only got eight employees, so that's a bit of a challenge in itself. So the financial summary, our revenues over the past couple of years have been very good, uh, around uh, 60 million Australian dollars, and, um, and uh, that was fairly flat. The oil price saved our bacon. Production was down a little bit, but the oil price uh, uh, meant our revenues stayed flat. Uh, our EBITDA was down, mainly due to uh, fluctuations in, uh, in uh, the... Uh, in uh, the uh, Australian dollar exchange rate, and also we had some, um, uh, some uh, write-downs. Uh, our cash balance has grown to uh, uh, about $68 million. At the 30th of June, it was $52 million. So we're continuing to grow a bit of a war chest, and I'm gonna describe how we're gonna spend some of that money going forward. So how do we make the move from good to great? Uh, our current status is that we're 160 million uh, market cap and our three to five year vision is to go to a billion market cap and that will put us in the top 10 EMP companies on the ASX. 
And how do we do that? Well, there's a couple of ways. We can uh, uh, buy companies. They're looking very cheap at the moment. We can buy assets. They're still looking quite expensive at the moment. But um, obviously, there's opportunities around as, uh, as uh, companies need, uh, need cash to develop their assets. And we can take advantage of our large cash uh, reserves. We're going to stay into conventional oil and gas. And we're going to stay with our Australia, Asia, Pacific uh, focus area. And uh, as, we, as we grow, we'll have a greater diversity of cash flow streams. We can fund our drilling from our existing cash flow and from our cash reserves. And we're going to maintain our focus on uh, working with uh, quality joint venture partners. We're very lucky in that we have some very good operators. If you want to uh, drive a car, you want to make sure, and you're going to be the passenger, you want to make sure that the driver is competent. And we're very lucky in the assets that we uh, we're involved in that we have some very competent operators. Uh, historically, we've been uh, exploration-led. And uh, I come from a production projects background, so we're going to be more production and profit-driven going forward. Uh, we've been in a non-operator position, hence we can survive with only eight employees. And I don't think that's going to last long. We're going to move towards operating oil and gas assets. And that's not no mean feat. So we'll probably start in something that's relatively simple, like an onshore area, rather than dive straight into an offshore asset. But nevertheless, we're building the systems and recruiting the people necessary to make that transition from non-operator to operator. And we're gradually going to move to uh, higher equity positions in the assets that we hold, from uh, typically sort of 10 to 15 percent into the 20 to 50 percent range. And as we build our concentration in a particular asset, then uh, we're more likely to be asked to be the operator. This is where our current assets are. We're in uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, um, and we have producing assets in New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, and Indonesia. We have uh, exploration assets in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and in Indonesia. We have very modest oil reserves at the moment about 3 million barrels of oil and about 120 BCF of gas, giving us about a total of 20, 23 million barrels of oil equivalent. The good thing about these reserves is most of them are already in production. So on the oil side, we've got um, production from uh, our interests in Mari Field in New Zealand, uh, from the Oyong Field in Indonesia. That's both oil and gas production. And we've got production from Southeast Gobi in uh, Papua New Guinea. We've just got a project uh, starting up at the moment, which is uh, in fact, there was an announcement on, uh, on Friday regarding the commencement of drilling the development wells on the Wartel project in Indonesia. So we've got a, a balanced portfolio of existing assets, some in the exploration phase, some in the appraisal, a, a few in development and a, a few in production. And in order to accelerate the growth of our company, we're going to focus on trying to acquire uh, some assets in the appraisal and development phase. Uh, because it's seven to ten years to move things through from starting out exploration to production. and can accelerate the growth process by attacking uh, proven undeveloped resources in, uh, in the appraisal and development phase. And that's where my expertise lies. That's where I come from, is in, uh, in, developing, uh, in, in developing new fields. So this is our uh, layer cake. Um, it's uh, looking pretty healthy. Uh, we've got uh, diverse cash flow streams from Southeast Gobi. The little yellow sliver you can see is the commencement of commercialization of the associated gas cap gas in Southeast Gobi. That's interesting. It's going to be the first gas that's exported to the PNG LNG project for commissioning in about June next year. And then we've got uh, uh, oil production from Southeast Gobi, oil production from Oyong. And we've got this uh, new layer, the orange layer, which is uh, the Wartel gas development, which is on schedule and on budget to come on stream in December. And that'll make a meaningful addition to our uh, future cash flows. And then out there, we've got some potential oil and potential gas uh, discoveries, which I'll talk about from our exploration. But the mainstay at the moment is our Mari and Manaya production, which is the, uh, the white uh, layer. So that differentiates us straight away from uh, some of the previous presenters in that we have existing cash flows from production. And so we're looking building from good to great rather than establish, making our first steps uh, towards uh, establishing a profitable business. 
So in Papua New Guinea, we only have a 3% interest in, uh, in these permits, uh, but it does provide us with some uh, base load of cash flow. Uh, we've got the Barry Kawa field, which we own 15% uh, of, which is uh, undeveloped. And uh, I'm sure that uh, through time that will be developed by the PNG LNG project. The, there's uh, anything up to 2.4 TCF of gas in that field. There are also some smaller discoveries, Billip, Aihi and Cobra, in, those, uh, in that area where we have a, uh, an 11% interest, which again, as uh, the, becomes ullage available in the PNG LNG gas pipeline, these may get to market. So that shows a, a de more detailed blow up. You can see um, from that uh, that these fields are all co close proximity with each other. And uh, the gas pipeline is actually going to go straight through the uh, southeast Gobi field location virtually. In Indonesia, we've got some existing production in the Sampang PSC. Uh, that's from uh, the Oyong oil field, which has some associated and gas cap gas, which is being exported to uh, a place called Grati, where there's a, a power station. And we're just developing the water oil gas uh, field. And in the Kutai Basin, we've got some uh, newly acquired exploration assets called Mahakam Hilia. We're in a partnership with our, uh, one of our major shareholders, which is uh, Singapore Petroleum, which is now owned by Petro China. And we're going to be drilling two wells in uh, December and January in that basin. So we've got two exciting near-term onshore oil and gas prospects, which I'll describe in a bit more detail. So in the Sampang PSC, we've got uh, two uh, uh, producing, f or one producing field, Oyong, which produces oil and gas. The gas goes to Grati. Uh, the oil gets exported via an FSO to uh, the international market. And uh, Wartel has, um, is, a, is a development project where we just, we just commenced on Friday, or actually Saturday morning, uh, drilling the two development wells for Wartel. After it's finished on uh, the Wartel drilling, the drilling rig's going to drill another infill well on Oyong. So that should increase our um, oil and gas production from Oyon and uh, Wartel to around 2,900 barrels of oil equivalent per day. And we've also got a discovery called Jeruk. Uh, it's currently in the, uh, in the uh, proven undeveloped uh, category and uh, is, is marginal in some respects in that it's uh, technically very challenging, but uh, the joint venture is starting to relook at this field. And uh, it was uh, originally lauded as being about 170 million barrels recoverable. So the P10 reserves are very large. Um, drilling two further appraisal wells drove the P90 reserve down to 4 million barrels, but there's an 80% certainty that the reserves are between 5 and 170 million barrels, if that's any help. So this, is, uh, just, this just shows you the Oyang and Wartel development scheme with some wellhead platforms a small FPSO and an FSO with gas being exported to the power station in Grati. And in the Kutai Basin, we're right in the thick of things. There's some very, very major fields. Most of these fields spawned the develop of a, a development of the Bontang LNG plant, uh, which has been producing for many, many years and is a, is a, is a major producer of gas in the region. The, the recoverable gas in this basin was 67 TCF and recoverable oil of 3.75 billion barrels. So it's a, a fairly prolific basin, and we've got a position there on the fringes of the basin which looks quite prospective. So again, we're in partnership. We've got a 40% interest, which is meaningful, and these are not small prospects. Um, we've got a 20 million barrel prospect called um, Naga Selatan, which is um, also the Southern Dragon, and the Northern Dragon, Naga Utara, is, uh, is about an 80 to 100 BCF uh, gas prospect. Uh, we'll be drilling those in the near term. Uh, interestingly, uh, the thing that we liked is uh, there's oil and gas coming out of the ground all over the place here. And um, it, when, we, when the SPC drilled the uh, shot holes for the seismic, they filled up with crude oil. So there's a fairly good indication of a prolific um, uh, oil and gas producing basin in the area. But uh, over the next uh, couple of months, we'll get to find out how prolific it is in our acreage. In New Zealand, we have a 5% interest in the Maori field, and, um, and that's operated by Todd. We're blessed with uh, competent operators, and uh, that produces uh, currently about uh, 
uh, 12 to 15,000 barrels a day, of which we've got a 5% interest. The Mari development is a well-head platform. There's uh, quite a lot of upside potential in the, in the acreage. Uh, we've got uh, two horizons that we know exist in the Manaya area. We've got the Moki formation, which was intersected by Maui 4. And we've got in the Mari structure, we've got the undeveloped uh, Mangahewa formation. Uh, so we know those. Is that five minutes or am I finished? OK, all right, I'll speed up. Thanks. OK, we've got some exploration in New Zealand. We've been shooting uh, 3D and 2D seismic over these structures in the recent past. Uh, there's a couple of structures that uh, are of interest. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Tawatu and Matariki. Uh, I think the most favoured prospect in PEP 51313 is currently Pike, which uh, is very much a Maori look-alike. Uh, on seismic, it looks smaller than Maori, but it's a, it's a Maori look-alike, and so we're looking at ways of commercialising that via a tie into Mari. And uh, in 51149 Pungare, who is the near shore, we've shot some near shore and in the transition zone seismic. And uh, that's uh, very similar to a sort of a Pohakura type development uh, scenario where you could drill wells from, uh, from onshore and intersect the, uh, the offshore horizon. So we're quite optimistic about our New Zealand exploration. In Australia, we've got uh, a very big hit in exploration coming up in the next six months. Woodside farmed into WA389P. They've now shot the Mavida 3D seismic survey and we'll be drilling a well before the end of June, um, which um, on our reckoning could be somewhere between 2 and t 10 TCF of gas. So the proof is in the pudding again, but it's a very meaningful um, uh, well for us and it will be a uh, a, a significant uh, a boon for, uh, for Q Energy resources if, if it comes in. We also farmed out two other, uh, two other permits to Apache. So we've got the big boys in our permits, WA359P and WA409P. Just completed seismic and drilling decisions will be made next year. And we're still hanging on in there in WA360P and W361P uh, with, uh, with MEO. And uh, we believe there's additional prospectivity in this, these blocks. One well does not make an exploration program, and so we're going to continue in those two permits. So looking at WA389P in a bit more detail, our favoured prospect was the Katarina prospect. That's what we farmed out the block on the basis of. You can see some very, very large numbers um, of the prospect sizes. But again, we're working through these numbers with Woodside, and over the next couple of months, We'll uh, focus in on one of these prospects and then go and drill it before June next year. So looking at our activity time, if you were looking at buying shares, now's the time because we've got two exploration prospects in December and we've got some uh, very big hitting exploration in, uh, in anything as early as March next year. So um, you know, now's the time to get in if you're going to get in. And uh, so it looks at, uh, we've got seismic exploration, that's largely gone now. We're in the, uh, uh, we're in the um, prospect definition phase where we're trying to identify where to drill our wells. In Indonesia, we've got two identified prospects which we're going to drill. Uh, that's going to be happening. We can fund those exploration activities from our existing cash. We're going to be drilling uh, Wartel development wells. Uh, we are drilling Wartel development wells at the moment. That's on schedule and on budget to come out at the end of the year, so you're going to see a big spike in uh, Q's cash flow in the next few months. And then uh, we've got uh, WA389P, which we're calling Katarina, but could be any one of those, uh, one of those prospects. And that's a duplicate. So uh, why invest in Q? We've got uh, an experience in energetic board and management. We've got a track record in successful company building. Uh, we've got new management with engineering, field development, and operational experience, which differentiates us from the previous management was largely exploration focused. We've got a good regional network. I've worked in Southeast Asia for many years. I worked in Malaysia for two years and spent a lot of time in upstream petroleum wearing out shoe leather around Southeast Asia. And, uh, and uh, a proven business development track record. We've got strong vision and drive to take Q4. We're determined to meet our objectives to move the company from good to great. Our differentiators are we are already profitable, we always make money, we just got to look at how we can reinvest that cash sensibly and back in the business. 
Uh, we've got $70 million in our balance sheet, so we can do some serious uh, investment with that. We've got near-term expiration in, in the first, fourth quarter 2011. Uh, we've got a new development project, and uh, we've got some high potential gas acreage, which could really take us to the next, le next level in the Carnarvon Basin. Anyway, um, that's it from me. Thanks very much.